My name is Amir Kevano Khandani and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the University of Waterloo. This presentation is composed of several parts. It targets audience from both industry and academia with interest in information theory, physical layer of wireless systems, wireless networks, security, and materials. The objective is to establish full duplex, also called two-way wireless links between an access point and multiple clients. Full duplex means two parallel pipes of data running in opposite directions. The complete overlap in time and frequency without the need to isolate them in time, frequency, or code domains, and without compromising spectral or power efficiency of each link. We would also like to support asynchronous clients, which will be useful in networking applications, and also support additional degrees of freedom offered by MIMO antenna systems. Current wireless systems are one way, in the sense that they use either two different time slots or two different frequency bands to send and receive. Even in the context of OFDM or CDMA, there is no practical method known to use two different tones or two different spreading codes to establish a full duplex link. Full duplex wireless is complicated due to potentially large amount of interference between transmitter and receiver units in a radio. And it's interesting that full duplex communications is used in almost every telecommunications technology, for example, in ordinary phones, DSL, wireless with highly directional antennas, free space optics, fiber, but not in wireless networks. Although the impact on wireless networks like cellular and WLAN is expected to be much higher, because in this context, two-way addresses, networking and security issues in addition to doubling the rate. Two-way wireless has been of interest over a relatively long period of time and there have been some other works addressing this problem. Here I have a partial list of some relevant works and getting into the details of the literature is well beyond the scope of this presentation. I would like to mention that my initial interest in this topic started in 2004 and I applied for a provisional patent in 2005 and for the actual patent in 2006 and this patent was issued in 2010 and this is easy to find on the web. The starting point for my work was to use multiple transmit antennas to create a null at the location of a receive antenna and in particular using two transmit antennas with 180 degree phase shift to create a norm at the position of the received antenna which is positioned in the middle of the two transmit antennas. And I would like to add that since that initial idea I have taken many more steps which I will share today and these have been subjects of some other patents that I have applied for. And there is just one other point I think I should clarify here in terms of the listed literature and this is about active cancellation. One of the components behind the performance I will present here is based on using the so-called active cancellation. This means a copy of interfering signal is constructed and subtracted in the analog domain prior to ATD. In general, active cancellation is an old area of research with many reported practical applications. What is new and critical in this work is that active cancellation is done in a way that it does not contradict linearity in the subtraction path. As a result, the method that I will present does not need to have a precise measurement of the cancellation coefficients. And any such lack of precision, which is unavoidable in full duplex transmission will be accounted for and compensated in the next step in baseband cancellation. As you see, some of more recent references I have listed here, which by the way I came to know after relevant parts 
in our implementation were completed also use active cancellation but their achieved gain due to this feature is limited due to the linearity issues that I mentioned and we will explain this later in more details here I have some more references published in 2011 I would also like to add that during the years that I have been working on this topic since 2005 I have come across more than 300 references articles and patents that in one way or other I thought had some relevance to this topic and what I am presenting is new and in my humble opinion it essentially solves the problem of two-way wireless I also present some new applications for such two-way wireless networks here I have a summary of what is new here with respect to my 2010 patent to start with I have extracted a figure from the 2010 patent for the design I talked about in the previous slides namely the use of two transmit antennas with 180 degree phase shift and the receive antenna in the middle and although this design is only part of that patent the summary of what is new is with respect to this design first some new antenna structures are presented by using multiple stages of cancellation it is shown that potential degradation in SNR due to self-interference is virtually zero I also present methods to support asynchronous clients as well as to support MIME in addition several new applications of full duplex wireless are presented overall hardware and signal processing complexities are very close to the case of a half duplex unit RF transmission is based on A to 2.11 using a 20 MHz channel at 2.4 GHz transmission power is about 30 dBm which is typical for cellular applications the basic physical layer follows A to 2.11 in terms of OFDM structure preamble synchronization and issues of this nature as mentioned for hardware implementation we use the software-defined radio platform by Lyrtec and the final outcome has been tested in outdoor and indoor environments and it essentially works as reliably as a one-way system the goal is to connect an access point to several clients clients are multiplexed using OFDMA and access point should support two-way connection over each OFDM tone while supporting the additional degrees of freedom offered by MIMO antenna system over each of those tones we would also like to support asynchronous clients in the sense that new clients can join the network without prior coordination and without waiting for too long and without disturbing the operation of the clients that are already in the network I believe two-way wireless will result in major changes in the way wireless networking is done for example measurements of actual wireless usage on UW campus shows that the efficiency for about 2,000 clients and the few hundred access points is around 5 to 10 percent and the reason is the MAC layer of A2.11 and two-way wireless will solve this issue cellular networks have a higher efficiency but the cost of infrastructure is very high and as we move towards smaller and smaller cell sizes the cost will not be affordable any longer in my opinion two-way wireless will have a higher impact than previous breakthroughs in this area like TurboCode, MIMO space division multiple access and the most recent breakthrough called interference alignment which was introduced in my own group in 2006 and since then has attracted significant attention here I have a summary of some of the novel ideas introduced in this work one contribution is in reducing the amount of self-interference in the analog domain prior to A to D and three complementary techniques are introduced for this purpose after that digital signal processing is used to further reduce the self-interference another contribution is in handling asynchronous clients 
Finally, some scenarios for the application of two-way wireless are introduced. These applications show that two-way wireless does much more than just doubling the rate. In particular, this presentation introduces a new way for wireless communications, which is based on changing the channel to embed information, and this is in contrast to traditional wireless systems which are based on changing the source while keeping the channel fixed. This is made possible if we have access to full duplex links. As we will see, there are major benefits to be gained by varying the channel. Full duplex transmission also solves the bottlenecks that currently exist in practical implementation of many of the information theoretic concepts. An example is space division multiple access, the so-called SDMA, in both downlink and uplink. It makes it also possible to cancel the interference that two neighboring nodes cause on each other. And possibility of supporting two-way asynchronous links with multiple clients also solves many of the MAC and quality of service issues that are currently reducing efficiency and increasing cost in wireless networks. Another contribution is in the context of security enhancement. Wireless is believed to be inherently insecure because everyone hears everyone else. But the same feature can contribute to making the system even more secure. The reason is that in a full duplex system, the two parties transmit at the same time, and this is in essence like jamming each other's signals when it comes to eavesdropping. This work introduces some mechanisms to take better advantage of this feature to enhance security. Another contribution is in secret key generation in the so-called one-time pad, which is the only absolutely secure system. And even in a point-to-point -point link, by simply feeding back a pilot, we can make sure that the two node nodes are synchronized. And lack of synchronization can be the primary factor determining the effective signal-to-noise ratio rather than Gaussian noise. And full duplex node also helps in power control, adaptive coding and modulation, ARQ to name a few. Basic hardware of two-way system was functional in late 2009. However, I avoided publicizing it first for the reason that I hoped to have a stronger impact by presenting a more mature system. And in particular, I had noticed that the earlier implementations reported in the 90s were forgotten over time as they did not provide a solution that would be acceptable to industry. And of course, I wanted also to have a protection of intellectual property by applying for patents. And the reason I am doing it now, because I think it's mature, and also I consider it my academic duty to report my findings. I'm thankful to Rafael Hernandez, who is a research engineer working with me for several years and he implemented the algorithms for two-way wireless on the software-defined radio platform by Leertech. I am thankful to Mohsen Baratfant, who is another research engineer working with me for several years, and he has been responsible for design, fabrication, and test of various circuits. I am thankful to Dr. Hossein Atiyah, who is a postdoctoral fellow working with me for about a year, and he has been responsible for HFSS simulation, antenna fabrications, and tests. I am grateful for generous and visionary support from Canadian government, in particular from Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, and also I am grateful to University of Waterloo for their general support and also for the liberal intellectual property policy, which simply says that the invention belongs to the inventor. With this introduction, let us start with the first part, which involves antenna design. An antenna is composed of two arms connected to terminal nodes and is surrounded by parasitic elements. We rely on using separate antennas to transmit and to receive, and I will later discuss the motivation behind using separate antennas. We would like to have a small coupling between transmitter and receive antennas, and this means a sinusoidal signal at the terminals of the transmit antenna 
should result in a small, ideally zero signal at the terminals of the receive antenna. And this should be the case over a large frequency range. We would also like to have good antenna efficiency, which means a small S11 and a small S22. We should keep in mind that the low coupling requirement in two-way wireless is very different from the requirement in the context of MIMO system, although the terminologies are the same, namely low coupling. The low coupling in MIMO essentially means that the channel gains between multiple transmit antennas to multiple receive antennas should be independent of each other, which causes the channel metrics to be non-singular. And this is difficult to satisfy if the antennas are placed too close to each other. However, low coupling in two-way wireless means that we require a small value for S12, which is also theoretically known to be equal to S21, and this requirement does not impose any immediate obvious restriction on antenna spacing. Interaction between transmit and receive antennas in a single unit is governed by near field phenomena. On one hand, near field is very powerful, which predicts a strong self interference, but the good news is that in dealing with near field phenomena, the field is predictable and consequently it can be managed. We rely on Maxwell equations which are linear in time and also have geometrical symmetry in the sense that if the shape, material, boundary condition and excitation have geometrical symmetry, then we obtain geometrical symmetry in the resulting wave. This symmetry in the wave can be used to cancel signals even if they are very strong. Here we have the Maxwell equation for steady state behavior of at a single frequency. The reason that we can rely on a single frequency analysis is that we are interested in the steady state response of the underlying linear system to a sinusoidal input and as the system of interest to us radiates energy because it, at the end of the day it's an antenna, the response to a sinusoidal input will be a sinusoid or at the same frequency. We define two antennas to be pairwise symmetrical if each antenna is sub-symmetrical in the sense that its arms are reflections of each other with respect to a plane of symmetry. And this includes the symmetry of excitation and also symmetry of parasitic elements. In addition, the two antennas should be mutually symmetrical in the sense that each antenna is invariant under reflection in the plane of symmetry of the other antenna. Here we have some examples where the red and the black antennas are pairwise symmetrical. If we have a pairwise symmetrical antennas, when we move from a point under reflection in the plane of symmetry to its mirror image, if this symmetry does not change the direction of the current, the field will be mirrored, and if the symmetry changes the direction of the input current, the field will be mirrored with a sign change. For example, in this figure, reflections in the yz plane mirrors the field without changing its sign, and the reflection in the xz plane mirrors the field and changes its sign. Another theorem says that for a pairwise symmetrical antenna, Coupling is zero independent of frequency. As a sketch of proof, let us consider this blue antenna as the transmit antenna and the green antenna as the receive. Considering the terminals of the receive antenna, we conclude that the electric field along the shortest line connecting the terminals will have symmetry with a sign change with respect to its middle point. Consequently, the integration of electric peak between the two terminals which is shown here by delta V, is zero. On the other hand, as the concept of voltage, which we are using here, in time-varying fields is not the best tool to rely on, next I will present a more rigorous proof based on the Pointing's theorem. Pointing's theorem in RF tells us that the flow of energy across the surface 
is equal to the integration of the point in this vector, which is E cross H over that surface. Now assume that we have a transmit and a receive antenna that are pairwise symmetrical as shown. And let us consider a symmetrical region around the receive antenna, which does not include any part of the transmit antenna. We divide this region into symmetrical pairs of surfaces as shown by 1 and 1 prime, 2 and 2 prime, and so on. And it is easy to see that the integration of the pointings vector over the surfaces cancel each other. And this means the net flow of energy across the whole surface is zero, which means that the receive antenna does not absorb any energy. Here I have some numerical results using HFSS. These antennas intentionally have unusual shapes to see how the antenna shape will affect the coupling. For the first two examples from the left, we have pairwise symmetry and the coupling is around minus 90 degrees. However, if we turn one of the antennas for 90 degrees, which is the configuration on the right hand side, we violate the pairwise symmetry condition and the coupling increases from minus 90 dB to minus 2 dB. And this also shows the strength of the field at the small distances. Similarly, we can have triple Y symmetrical antennas, as shown here, resulting in a diagonal matrix. And any two of these antennas are pairwise symmetrical and can be used to establish a two-way link. It remains to generalize these constructions to support MIMO antennas. To do this, we need two sets of antennas in each unit, one set to transmit and the other set to receive. And we would like to have a small coupling between every antenna in the transmit set and every other antenna in the receive set. A straightforward approach is to use the same planes of symmetry to produce more antennas as it is shown here. But this results in poor radiation efficiency because the antennas' arms will be far away from each other. And consequently, we need a different approach to realize this goal. The good news is that if we rely on three dimensions, we can indeed find two sets of antennas such that every element in the first set, for example, antennas shown in blue, is pairwise symmetrical with every element in the second set, which are the antennas shown in red in these figures. On the other hand, many practical antenna systems are two-dimensional, and it remains to find a way to extend the support to MIMO to two dimensions. A key observation leading to such construction is that the electric field due to symmetrical antenna will be orthogonal to its plane of symmetry. This observation motivates us to place one set of antennas in the plane of symmetry of another set. For example, here we have the black antenna with V-shaped arms and the three red horizontal antennas are placed in its plane of symmetry. HFSS simulation shows that the coupling between one vertical and one horizontal dipole is about minus 70 dB. Interestingly, the optimum spacing between the two antennas is found to be about 0.1 cm, meaning that increasing the spacing between them does not necessarily reduce the coupling. In this configuration, the right hand arm of the horizontal antenna is further away from the vertical antenna as compared to its left hand arm. So in an attempt to partially compensate for this imbalance, I asked the sortier to increase the size of the right hand arm to provide a larger pool of electrons, which indeed helped and reduced the coupling to minus 110 dB. I should emphasize that in practice, there are many other factors, including reflections from the surrounding environment, which will reduce the coupling to around minus 30 to minus 40 dB. And having these other imperfections as the actual bottlenecks, there is not really any strong motivation to try to reduce the coupling between the antennas significantly below minus 40, minus 50 dB.
The idea of placing one set of antennas in the plane of symmetry of another set can be used to generate two sets to be used in MIMO setups. For example, here the black antennas can be used as multiple transmit antennas and the red antennas as multiple receive antennas. As mentioned before, symmetry should be ideally with respect to both antenna and the parasitic elements surrounding it. And for this reason, in the fabrication of the circuits, we have aimed to maintain the symmetry in the sense that if there is a piece of circuit that cannot be avoided, for example, the footprint for the balloon, we included the same footprint on the other side to maintain the symmetry. And this indeed helped in reducing the coupling. Here are HFSS simulation results. As you see, across the frequency band of 2.2 to 0.6 gigahertz, we have a coupling of around minus 100 dB. Similarly, here we have two horizontal antennas to be used in a MIMO system. The blue curve is the coupling between antenna 2 and 3, and it's very high. And the red and the black curves are the coupling between the vertical and the two horizontal antennas, showing values around minus 90 to minus 100 dB. Next, we have added some parasitic elements in HFSS. And the coupling between the vertical and horizontal antenna has reduced from around minus 90 dB to around minus 30 dB. And here we have added similar parasitic elements to the other side to maintain the symmetry, to bring back the symmetry, and consequently the coupling has reduced to around minus 75 to minus 87. I would like to emphasize at this point that in the constructions we have discussed so far, namely in the pairwise symmetrical antennas, triplewise symmetrical antennas, and in constructions based on placing one set of antennas in the plane of symmetry of another set, the low coupling is not due to polarization. Indeed, as we are dealing with near field effects, the concept of polarization cannot be even defined properly. We discussed some symmetry conditions that are sufficient to have zero coupling. And an interesting question would be to see if the sufficient conditions are also necessary or not. Here I have the antenna structures connected to the network analyzer showing a bandwidth of about 30 MHz at 2.4 GHz. The coupling is around minus 60 dB. And my colleague moves the antenna, slight movements, uh, from a distance such that his body doesn't interact with the antenna structure. And we see that small movements can change the coupling in the range of minus 30 to minus 60, minus 70 dB. And this is something we need to deal with. Here I have a closer look at the antenna structures, one horizontal, two vertical antennas, and the total area is about 7 centimeter by uh, 8 centimeter. This leads us to the second stage of cancelling self-interference prior to A to D in the analog domain. By signal injection, I mean forming an appropriate signal in the basement, modulating it to RF frequency with the same carrier as used to, for transmission, and adding it in the receive chain prior to A to D to reduce the amount of self-interference. The operation of adding up two RF signals is relatively simple and is similar to combining I and Q signals that is commonly done in almost every modern radio. Instead of signal injection, we can also rely on beam forming in the sense that we can use multiple transmit antennas with baseband beam forming to cancel each other in the air at the position of the receive antenna in each OFDM tone. At this point, it's important to clarify that by signal injection, we are not bypassing one problem and replacing it with another one. In the sense that we are not bypassing the error due to A to D and replacing it with the error due to D to A, which will occur in constructing that corrective signal. This is not the case because unlike A to D, the D to A operation is linear. As a result, the impact of D to A error or any other error that we may have 
in that part of constructing the signal and injecting it will be due to some linear operations. And consequently, it can be compensated by an operation similar to equalization at the baseband of OFD. And this is based on measuring the overall channel from transmit baseband to receive baseband, which shows the residual self-interference, and using it to subtract the remaining self-interference in the baseband in the OFD. Here we have two transmit antennas that are used for corrective beam forming. The way it works is that we send pilots from the first transmit antenna, measure the corresponding channel, then send pilots from the second transmit antenna, measure the corresponding channel, and then finally we send pilots with corrective beam forming coefficients from both antennas at the same time and measure the equivalent channel from the transmit baseband to the receive baseband in the OFDM. We then multiply the signal that we are transmitting by the coefficients of this channel in every tone of OFDM and subtract it at the baseband. Having said this, we do not need necessarily to rely on two full power transmit antennas. Instead, we can have one transmit antenna which transmits at high power which is essentially meant to communicate to the distant nodes and the second antenna can have a high coupling to the receive antenna such that it can cancel the interference through corrective beam forming with a small radiation power. We can also inject a corrective signal using the same method as used in combining I and Q without any transmission and in the case of MoMO system, we can rely on similar methods to reduce the self-interference between the set of transmitting antennas to the set of receiving antennas. In this case, the self-interference channel is a matrix, and we have a separate corrective signal for each receive antenna, and these corrective signals are formed as linear combinations of different transmit signals, again in the OFDM domain, with beam forming coefficients which are co computed from that matrix showing the coupling between the multiple transmit to the multiple receive antennas. 3D constructions explained earlier can be also realized using closely spaced antennas, for example using the two sides of a PCB using patch structures. This observation enables us to simplify antenna structures by merging antenna arms. Merging of antenna arms into a single patch above ground plane provides the basis to simplify signal cancellation in the RF as well as in the basement. And here I have three examples of such designs. And here we have this idea generalized to multiple input, multiple output antenna structures. Discussions so far were based on reducing the amount of self-interference prior to A to D in the analog domain. Next step is cancellation in the digital domain. As I mentioned earlier, we start by sending pilots from the two transmit antennas separate in time and measure the channel from the two transmit antennas to the receiver, which are shown here by H1 and H2 with possible error terms of delta H1 and delta H2. After measuring these channels, we send pilots from the two antennas at the same time such that they cancel each other at the receiver. And this is done by fixing the beam forming coefficients at the values that we found in the first measurement, in the earlier measurement. And these are the values that we will be using throughout the cancellation when it's uh, after training when we use it in action. The math is shown here, P plus delta P is the pilot that you are transmitting with the error term delta P in it. We multiply it by H1 plus delta H1 because this is our understanding of the H1 channel and this is what we will be relying on throughout the measurement and subsequent actual usage. And the multiplication by H2 uh, in the first term is achieved over the air or through uh, the 
signal combining that we have. And if you go through the math, you see that we obtain two terms. The second term involves multiplication of delta errors in H1 and H2 times the error in P, and it can be ignored. The consequence is that we obtain a channel as shown in the first term here, meaning H2 delta H1 minus H1 delta H2 times P. And this is the channel of self-interference from the baseband of transmit chain to the baseband of the receive chain after applying the corrective uh, active cancellation. Now let us look at what happens when we transmit uh, to OFDM data. Here gamma plus delta gamma is the data that we are transmitting with some possible error in it. And this is multiplied by the beamforming coefficient of H1 plus delta H1 and H2 plus delta H2. One of them with a negative sign such that they cancel each other. And these are transmitted by the two transmit antennas which are then multiplied by H1 and H2 over the air and added at the receiver end. At the receiver end, we have the second term of the first equation on the right-hand side of the equality sign, and this is composed of two terms. The first captures the effect of the residual self-interference, which is again an OFDM signal, and its effect will be subsequently compensated by baseband self-interference removal. The remaining error term is due to computational errors and this is known in digital domain and can be compensated if needed in the digital domain. However, in practice we did not see any evidence that this step of signal correction is needed. I would like to add that in order to minimize the degradations due to possible mathematical errors we should start with the smallest number of bits to represent the cancellation points in the OFDM domain, and this will minimize the number of bits required for subsequent operation of IFFT and FFT. And as in wireless, we usually use small cancellations, for example, 16 quorum or 64 quorum. We can indeed start with a small number of bits such that the growth in the number of bits due to calculations does not uh, end up taking us out of our uh, accuracy range. It's also possible to improve the effective dynamic range of the A to D by clipping the signal and subsequently only accounting for the transmit parts for the pieces that are clipped and we know what we are transmitting so we can do it. Again, in the experiments that we have had, there was no evidence that there is a need to do this in practice. Here I have some numerical values showing typical performance of the system. Antenna structure is the same as what was used in the earlier video clip. Transmit power for each transmit antenna is set to 30 dB. And in total, because we are transmitting from two antennas, the transmit power will be higher than what is typical in cell phone applications. First, we transmit the same pilot from the two antennas without applying any beamforming coefficients. We see that the increase in the level of noise due to the self-interference is about 40 dB. This shows the effect of the interference remaining just relying on the structure of the antennas. Then we adjust the coefficients of the two transmit antennas in each OFTM tone such that they cancel each other at the receive antenna. And this 40 dB drops down to about 2 dB. Finally, after subtracting the residual interference at the baseband, we have small and on the average about 0.4 dB increase in the noise flow. I should emphasize that this 0.4 dB degradation SNR is less than what is typical when transmitter and receiver are in different locations. The reason is that distant units should rely on different carriers and different clocks with possible mismatch between them and these sources of imperfections usually cause a degradation which is higher than 0.4 dB. In contrast, in dealing with self-interference, we use the same carrier and the same clock 
for transmit and receive and we have a precise measurement of timing as well and this result in very accurate cancellation of self interference. Here I have the same antenna structure but this time is connected to LearTech platform and we will be looking at different signals in real time in the baseband. The lowest signal shows the transmit power corresponding to the preamble sent from the first antenna from the second antenna followed uh, by the preamble sent from both antennas at the same time to measure the equivalent channel followed by several OFDM uh, frames and those spikes are the OFDM frames that are transmitted uh, from the two transmit antenna at the same time. This middle signal shows the received power corresponding to the first preamble, corresponding to the second preamble, and finally the effect of the cancellation in the air due to pre-equalization uh, multiplication by the beam forming coefficient to cancel at the receiver antenna. And then on top we have the final cancellation, the top signal, shows the effect of the final cancellation which is the subtraction of the transmitted signal from the equivalent single input single output channel that we have from the two transmit antenna to the receiver antenna and uh, we want we would like to study the effect of uh, different environments in terms of reflection on the performance of the overall sim system which is the combination of the cancellation in the air and final cancellation. To do this, my colleague is bringing a metallic plate close to the antenna to change the reflection and as you see, the signals all fluctuate quite significantly in terms of the transmit power because the channel coefficients are changed in terms of the received signal at the two antennas which show that the coupling can be so quite significantly different but um, the final algorithm or the combination of all of this working together is able to cancel the self-interference and we have a very stable performance overall at the received. Here we have a patch antenna including the transmitter, receiver and the auxiliary transmitter all merged together. Now my colleague brings the metallic ruler close to the antenna to change the coupling and the lowest signal which shows the transmit energy the middle signal which shows the effect of the cancellation due to the first algorithm fluctuate quite significantly but the top signal which is the effect of the final cancellation in the basement has a stable performance. In order to use a full duplex link to facilitate networking it's important to be able to support asynchronous client. Here I have an access point A communicating with the client unit B using a transmit and a receive antenna. And there may be several such clients which are multiplexed using OFDMA and are synchronized within the OFDM cyclic prefix. Now a new unit, unit C, wants to join this network without any prior coordination with the rest. Unit A, which is the access point, should be able to detect the presence of unit C and subsequently allocate some of the OFDM tones to it and also synchronize it with the other clients. Unit C starts a transmission by sending a periodic sequence and this is the common approach in wireless to establish a connection and there are two reasons for sending a periodic sequence. One reason is that when a periodic sequence passes through the linear system corresponding to the channel it results in a periodic sequence of the same period. And this periodicity can be detected at the receiver by using a correlation calculation, which essentially uses two consecutive windows of the length of the signal period and shift the received signal sample by sample through these two windows and compute the inner product of the two vectors. And when the periodicity starts, it causes a peak in the correlation values. And the phase of the correlation value at this peak provides the information adequate to compute the frequency offset. We need to make sure that the amount of self-interference does not cause a loss of this correlation peak. To do this, we use another stage of interference cancellation in the basement. 
However, this stage is implemented in a time domain, and consequently, it does not need to be synchronized with the UFDM structure. The filter in time domain can be computed directly and can be also obtained by converting the OFDM filter to time. And this filter does not need to completely cancel the interference. All what we need is a decent reduction in the amount of self-interference such that the periodic signal coming from unit C can be detected. As this stage of interference cancellation that is added in the time domain is also linear, it does not contradict the requirement we have for the linearity of the system and consequently we can just have the output of this stage to go to the next stage of cancellation which is in the baseband of OFDM domain. Although this is possible, it's not a requirement and the input to the cancellation in OFDM domain does not necessarily need to go through this stage of cancellation in the time domain as this block diagram here show. Next part is about network applications. To put the discussion in perspective, here I have some data from WLAN traffic on UW campus. It involves about 1400 wireless access points on, across campus serving about 4,200 active wireless IPs. And the two curves in both, the x-axis is the time of the day, and the left-hand side curve shows the number of active users, and the right-hand side curve shows their traffic uplink and downlink together. We see that at its peak, there are 1,800 users active, and the total rate for them for uplink and downlink together is about 150 megabit per second. This means that the rate per user on the average is 70 kilobits and the peak of it is about 80 kilobits per second. Here we see a busy access point in the library and at its peak there are 24 clients connected to it and the total bitrate for all of these clients up and down links together is about 3.4 megabit per second which is only 6% of the peak rate of the access point. And the point is that in this situation, the users have a very poor experience. And in general, when the number of clients connected to an access point is more than 10, most of the time, they access a new access point. And the point is that this poor quality of service is not due to the throughput of the system per node but to the way the networking is done and to the way that they get access to the network. In general, control signaling, and in particular signaling in the offline, that is required for new clients to join the network is the primary bottleneck in many networking setups. The good news is that the methods I described earlier for handling asynchronous users enable us to superimpose a network of half duplex, low bitrate, and low power pipes of data for control signaling on top of the primary full duplex data links. These superimposed links are separated from the primary full duplex data links in the code domain. Among themselves, they are time multiplex and use carrier sense multiple access. But conventional problems of CSMA are avoided as these links operate in parallel with the primary full duplex data links without causing too much disturbance. Due to low power signaling for the superimposed links, we will naturally have a low spectral efficiency but this is not an issue as control signaling has a minor load on the overall network throughput. I cannot get into the details here due to time limitations, but the corresponding physical layer is also designed such that full duplex links can detect and cancel the interference by the superimposed control links, although this is most likely not necessary. As we mentioned before, the possibility of supporting two-way asynchronous links solves many of the issues that we have in current wireless networks. 
and also enables some new signaling schemes. For example, when we have two interfering nodes that are simultaneously transmitting, they can also listen to each other, and after that, they can collaborate in their next transmissions to reduce the effect of the interference. In the context of network information theory, this is known as interference channel with collaborating transmitters and full duplex links will make it possible um, to have such systems work in practice. More generally, majority of discussions in network information theory are based on a simple and idealistic model in which multiple signals received at a node add together with fixed gains. And to reach to this idealistic model, which indeed can be realized using OFDM, we need to make sure that the different nodes do not have any offset in terms of particularly frequency. And normally, frequency offset is detected by the receiver side and compensated at the receiving node. And such a thing will not be possible if the signal that is received comes from several transmitters because we cannot collect all of them at the receiver. For example, in a multiple access scenario, when we have a receiver with multiple antennas receiving signal from several transmitters forming a multiple access channel and we want to use the degrees of freedom offered in space by the multiple receive antenna to separate them it will be very difficult to synchronize them in terms of the carrier. However, in this case, if the multiple access node broadcasts as pilot in its downlink, and it can do it because it is full duplex, every node will receive it and can use it as a reference for their carrier, and then all of them will be synchronized. Another example is the case of a multiple antenna broadcast channel used for space division multiple access in which receivers can continually provide a transmitter of the changes in their respective channels. And this will help to have the uh, precodings required for space division multiple access. In addition, the feedback link that exists in the full duplex link can be helpful in sending pilots in point to point connection in ARQ, adaptive transmission, power control etc. And also nodes can have a, an indication of the level of interference in their environment by listening while transmitting and using that information to adjust their transmission. The setup here is a basic interference channel in which transmitters nodes collaborate to reduce the effect of the multi-user interference. In information theory there is an implicit notion of causality which assumes that such collaborations should remain restricted to past symbols and in particular cannot involve the current symbol. And this is the cause of some major drawbacks. However, as long as the relative delays in an OFDM network are within the secret preface of the OFDM and this captures the channel memory, all transmission links, regardless of what their actual delay is, will be equivalent to multiplication of each OFDM tone by a complex value. And relying on this observation, here each transmitter, TX1 and TX2, filter the signal that they receive from the other node, and within the same OFDM frame, superimpose it on their own signal, such that when it's received at the destination, it cancels the interference terms coming from the other node through the crosslink. And some basic math shows that the two receive filters should, should have the expressions given here. This selection does increase the transmit energy because of the filtering, but it will cancel the interference at the receiver nodes. This means we are able to achieve a multiplexing gain of 1 instead of 0.5. And the key point is that we did not wait for one OFDM symbol. We waited for the minimum amount that was required, and those was the cyclic prefix of an OFDM, which is essentially captures the channel memory. Here is a more detailed block diagram of the same setup. Next part is about security applications. 
Unbreakable security or where now cipher is based on using a mask like Z, which is known by the two legitimate parties, and in communicating a message X, the transmitting node adds the message X and the mask Z modulo 2, and this operation will be reversed at the receiver end by another modulo addition with the same mask Z. The first novelty in my proposed approach to security relies on the observation that the modulo addition of binary values can be replaced by modulo 2 by addition of phase values and both convey zero information about their components. And the addition of phase values is done automatically as part of the RF propagation and consequently wireless transmission itself can act as a mask if we use PSK modulation for transmission. The main idea is that we can use a phase value shared between the transmitter and the receiver as a key or as a one-time path to mask one PSK symbol. Under this situation, if an eavesdropper listens to such a transmission, it will hear it with an independent phase value that is introduced by the channel between legitimate transmitted antenna to the receiving antenna of the eavesdropper. And consequently, will not provide any useful information. The main challenge is that when the transmitter and the receiver are far from each other, it will not be possible to use the same wireless channel that exists between them to agree on the phase values to be used as keys in subsequent transmissions. However, full duplex links provide the required tool to establish such a reference of phase between the transmitter and the receiver that are in different locations. I should add that there have been a large number of prior works trying to address various ways to use channel reciprocity to create keys for security. However, these earlier works cannot rely on phase values simply because they do not have uh, underlying full duplex links and in particular they do not exploit the addition of phase values which happens automatically as part of the transmission. Here is such a system for sharing a common phase value between Alice and Bob relying only on the wireless channel that exists between them. In this setup, Alice and Bob each have two antennas and both antennas have transmit as well as the receive capability. The key point behind the algorithm is that in each round of generating a common phase value, each antenna transmits only once. And this is possible by using a transmit as well as a receive chain for each antenna. As the sketch of proof, let us consider a situation that Eve has a large number of antennas distributed in the area and each antenna has a large signal to noise ratio. Alice and Bob collectively have four antennas and use each of them only once. Consequently, each of Eve's antennas will hear four signals, but each of these four signals is through its own channel with an unknown phase. And if two phase values are added modulo 2 pi, the result conveys zero information about either of them. For this reason, Eve will not be able to extract any useful information about the phase value exchange between Alice and Bob. Here I have an alternative setup with the advantage that the antennas do not need to be connected to both transmit and receive chains. If you look at the input and output signals in each unit in the baseband, this four-dimensional vector spans a two-dimensional space. And the important point is that in the steady state, the gain from I1 to O1 will be the same as the gain from I2 to O2. And this is similar to the reciprocity that we had in the previous setup. And similarly, it will enable us to reduce the number of transmissions to the minimum to make it impossible for Eve to extract useful information. For example, Alice and Bob can simultaneously transmit a known pilot. And in the next transmission, one of them changes the sign of its pilot. This gives enough equation to Alice and Bob to compute two phase values of G12 and G21 
and we use only one of these two as a common phase value and the key. As usual, after this exchange of common phase value, we ter perturb the channel and this perturbation is done at both Alice and Bob transmit antennas. Then they quietly measure the channels from their own transmit antennas to their receive antennas for the purpose of corrective beamforming and the process continues. Here we have a more detailed view on this setup. Once again, the key point behind security is that each eavesdropping antenna is subject to a new unknown phase in listening to any of the legitimate transmit antennas. Next part is about using full duplex capability towards enhancing the security. In general, two-way wireless is inherently more secure because a potential eavesdropper will receive the sum of the signals transmitted by legitimate parties. And to further enhance the security, we note that in practical OFDM systems, there is always the need for using a periodic preamble for frequency and time synchronization. In this case, after the initial stage that the connection has been established, Alice transmits a periodic sequence to Bob, and Bob simultaneously transmits the same periodic sequence with a high power. As a result, an eavesdropper will receive the sum of these periodic sequences passed through this, their respective channels, and the received signal remains periodic. Alice then introduces a random frequency offset in each of its transmissions. As Bob has transmitted this periodic sequence with a high power, it will make it difficult for Eve to understand the random offset that is introduced in Alice's carrier frequency. However, Bob will have no problem in detecting the frequency offset. And Alice already knows what the offset is. As a result, in this manner, they will be able to create some additional confusion for Eve. And when it comes to transmitting OFDM data from Alice to Bob, Bob can transmit noise to make the eavesdropping more difficult, or preferably, Bob transmits a secret key from a Gaussian codebook, for example, to be used by Alice as a partial or as a complete key in its next transmission from Alice to Bob. Relying on current technology, it is feasible to have hundreds of independent, low-power radios in the unit with low cost. Relying on full duplex links, the setup shown here is, corresponds to a scenario to exploit such a large number of transmit antennas to save energy through beamforming. And as the eavesdropper does not know the beamforming coefficients, the gain in SNR, which can be easily in the range of 20 dB, contributes to noise margin for eavesdropping. I would like to add that methods known for transmit at very low energy levels, like ultra-wide band communication, are different from this setup in the sense that ultra-wide band communication does not distinguish users based on their channel signatures. So the receivers, including eavesdropper and legitimate receivers, will be all in the same situation in terms of their ability to detect the signal. This part introduces a new way to wireless communication based on changing the transmission channel rather than the conventional methods in which the channel is fixed and the source is varied to embed the information. By the terminology source-based wireless, I'm referring to known methods for wireless transmission which are based on varying a source according to the information we would like to transmit and sending the resulting signal through the wireless channel which is a linear system and is fixed. In this case, the channel capacity scales with the bandwidth and with the log of SNR. MIMO antenna systems, which are considered as the most important breakthrough in wireless in the last decade, are based on using multiple transmit and multiple receive antennas to have 
an additional scale factor in the capacity expression which is equal to the minimum of m and n where m and n are the number of transmit and receive antennas. The idea of media-based wireless, which is introduced in this presentation, is based on transmission of information by varying the channel as well as possibly by varying the source. Particularly, the part that makes it different is that the channel is now intentionally varied to embed information. The concept is very simple. Here on the left, the rabbit is keeping the source fixed and communicating by changing the channel. And the solution does not need to be this extreme case. We can embed, embed information in both source and channel. And as we will see later, embedding information in the channel variations has some very interesting features that open up a whole new way of establishing wireless communications. The solution for the CISO case is simple. We should select the channel with the highest gain and then use it with a Gaussian source. This is based on the assumption that there is no upsampling at the receiver. This results in the saving of energy which scales with log of the cardinality of the channel code. However, a more interesting situation occurs when we have a single transmit antenna and multiple receive antenna. In a traditional signal system, when we have one transmit and n receive antennas, the received signal always spans a one-dimensional subspace and consequently, the best we can do is to save energy by maximum ratio combining of received signals. However, if we change the channel, the signal received by different received antennas will not be linearly dependent any longer. This results in a full rank constellation over the space of received antennas. And due to this full rank property, the rate that we can embed in the channel codebook grows linearly with n. And this is similar to the phenomenon that we have in MIMO. I should add that although here we are using only one transmit antenna instead of n, we can have significant gains with respect to an n by n MIMO and this is due to underlying selection gain and also independence of Gaussian noise at the receive antennas which will be discussed later. In summary, in a media-based SIMO setup with one transmit and end receive antennas, elements of the channel codebook span an n-dimensional space over the receive antennas, so we have the MIMO benefit that the rate increases linearly with n. In addition, we have independent additive Gaussian noise over the end receive antennas, which is similar to a MIMO with orthogonal channel matrix. And this feature on its own results in some additional saving in energy due to this orthogonality feature. We can further improve the energy efficiency by relying on selecting a subset of the channel codebook resulting in some selection gain. And as a result, we require less energy, but we are also now using a smaller subset of channel codebooks and the trade-off between these two phenomena should be adjusted according to the points that we are operating at. To make it more formal, the intention is to change the channel state by changing the RF environment around the transmitter and we have a set of channel states and the transmitter can select any of these in a given transmission interval and this operation can be repeated. Even if the transmitter does not know the exact channel state, the details of the channel state, it can select it based on its label and this label contains the information. We call this a channel codebook and on top of this channel codebook there is also a source that generates the signal to be sent through the resulting channel. So the net effect is that the information is embedded in a two-tuple composed of a codeboard from the source codebook and the codeboard from the channel codebook and at the receiver we have the product of these two codeboards plus additive white Gaussian noise. What we will be discussing is the case that 
The transmitter has a single antenna. In this case, source code book is a complex quantity. And receiver has multiple antennas. In this case, channel code book will be a vector. So the product of SC and CC is the product of a complex number by a vector. We also assume that the receiver, through a training phase, knows the element of the channel code book, but the transmitter does not know the details of this element, and also, if it helps by using a simple yes or no feedback, transmitter and receiver can agree on a subset of channel code books code book to be used in the actual transmission phase. Overall, the system is linear in the sense that the superposition principle holds, but the impulse response is intentionally changed or switched prior to reaching to its steady states. Consequently, the channel code book is a discrete set, and due to the Rayleigh fading, statistical property of channel code book has spherical as I mentioned earlier, we assume the cardinality of the channel code book is finite. Otherwise, the capacity, because of the possibility of exploiting the selection gain, would become infinity, which is of course unrealistic, and reflects the fact that for channel code books of large size, models of rich scattering and Rayleigh fading are not valid any longer. In any event, system is linear, superposition principle holds but it changed prior to reaching to its steady state. To continue our discussion, the assumption was that the transmitter does not know the details of the channel codebook and consequently it selects the channel codebook and the source codebook independent of each other and selects the element of the channel codebook with equal probability. At the receiver, Source codebook sp spans a single dimension along the received vector of channel codebook. And due to spherical symmetry, it depends only on the magnitude of channel codebook. Optimization of source codebook consequently involves only the radial component of wire, and receiver uses joint decoding to minimize the probability of outage. This page discusses the distribution of the capacity achieving source codebook. I do not get into the details of this page, but the final conclusion is that the capacity achieving source codebook has a uniform phase and is composed of a finite number of circular shells, and these shells are used with different probabilities in order to realize some shaping gain, but the points on each shell have equal probability, which reflect the fact that phase has a uniform distribution. Next question is what happens to the power spectrum when we change the channel in each transmission? Any receiver will be affected by side changes and will observe a widened spectrum of energy. As a result, it's important to understand how the power spectrum will behave. It's straightforward to show that the power spectrum of this system will be the average of the power spectrums of different channels times the power spectrum of the source when it's limited within a rectangular window. And this window captures the switching operation. Due to this rectangular window, the overall bandwidth will be infinity. The good news is that the power spectrum observed by any receiver will have the power spectrum of the source as a multiplicative factor. And as a result, by shaping the power spectrum of the source to have smooth transitions between consecutive switchings of the channel states, we can limit the overall power spectrum. The challenges we face in realizing such a media-based transmission system is that the frequency synchronization and the feedback between transmitter and receiver for codebook selection would be difficult. And this is where full duplex communication comes to the picture to facilitate these operations. Also note that when the receiver sends a pilot to the transmitter to be used for synchronization, 
it does not need any pulse shaping because the variations in the channel are happening around the transmitter. As a result, if there are other nodes in the network, they will not see the expansion in the spectrum for this case. The second challenge is that the receiver needs to learn the code book, and this can be done in a training phase and subsequently improved as more symbols are received. Another issue concerns the equalization. If the channel does not change, we can use a variety of methods for equalization. But here the channel impulse response will be intentionally changed from transmission to transmission. The good news is that when we send an impulse response and receive a response of length m, those m samples are again independent of each other. In other words, they span an m-dimensional space. As a result, by waiting and using the rest of the impulse response as additional constellation dimensions, we will not be losing the degrees of freedom offered by those dimensions. And this is achieved without equalization. Note that if we do the same in a traditional system, as we change the source, the vectors of different responses will be linearly dependent and we cannot achieve anything other than a boost in energy, which is in essence what a match filter does. Here we have some features of the SISO media-based transmission, which essentially reflect the fact that although the channel impulse response is intentionally changed from transmission to transmission, the superposition principle still applies to this cell. Here we look again at the case of media-based SISO transmission. I do not get into the details of this discussion, but the final conclusion is that in a rich scattering environment, if the channel response is of length L, by upsampling the output, we can increase the space dimensionality by a factor up to L with respect to the traditional limits known for a time invariant band limited channel based on Nyquist sampling theory. Next, we come to perturbing the RF channel. As I mentioned, the key component behind security application and media-based communications is the ability to change the transmission media from symbol to symbol. And the transmission media here is the RF environment around the transmitter antenna. In general, tunable RF based on changing the dielectric property of material by applying voltage is an active area of research. The good news is that in our case, all we need is the ability to change the channel from one random state to another random state. We do not need to know what the current state is and what the future state will be, and we do not have the intention to control the state. In addition, channel state in our case includes the channel phase, and it is fairly easy to change the phase in a rich scattering environment such that we move from one stable point to another stable point in a way that we obtain independent phase values. Unlike our case, in traditional RF applications, the intention is usually to concentrate the available energy in certain directions, which are called antenna beams, and it is also desirable that one can move such antenna beams in different directions, which is called beam steering. These are in general much harder to achieve as compared to our case, which involves just changing the channel phase. Here I have some concluding remarks. It is my humble opinion that two-way wireless will have a very profound impact on wireless networks in terms of cost, quality of service, and security in the near future. And it has much to offer, much more than the earlier breakthroughs reported in the area of wireless in the last few decades. An example is multiple input, multiple output antenna systems. In terms of what is next, industry will definitely play the main role 
in speeding up the developments in this area. And it should, of course, start by including two way wireless in the forthcoming wireless standards. And I hope that my presentation has conveyed the message that the implementation is straightforward and the performance is very stable. And here I have a set of frequently asked questions that I will update as I receive more. Please kindly send me any questions that you feel would be appropriate to add to this collection. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Please kindly send me any comments you may have. I will greatly appreciate it.